Bom bom. Bom. Bom bom. Bom. Bom bom. Bom. Bada bada. Right then, this is part six of fourteen, the sea power behind the Ring of Iron, near Stern. Edward's first attempt to conquer by civil engineering. Rudlan Castle. Now Rudlan is my favourite. Well, my favourite so far. I have to say Rudlan is the first castle which is really a massive construction, a massive piece of civil engineering that survives. Flint, Hardon, they have their parts. You know, Flint has that beautiful, uh, that beautiful detached tower idea, which is a really cool thing. Rudlan has the six great towers. And Rudlan is in many ways the template for what the others would all uh, could have been. Because I would argue Rudlan gets the closest to completion of all of them. I don't know. Bermaris does pretty well. Anyway, geography again match matters. Rudlan is five hours march. Five hours march from Flint Castle. That's slightly more complicated. Yes, you can probably ride it not that long a time. So certainly with alerting distance, but you prefer not to. And as you can see, there's a lovely picture from Google Maps of the castle as it exists today. And you'll notice it's on the English side of that river. It's it's in Wales, definitely, but it's on the English side of the river rather than the Welsh side. And it's about half a day's sail from Flint. And that is a lot of area which it starts to have an impact on. There's a lot of area it's starting to have control on and giving you control of. Because again, the modern roads are not that different from the roads in that time. In fact, if you're looking at them, you can see some very straight patches of road which look very Roman, even on this map. Trust me, if you ever drive them, you realise how Romanesque some of those roads are. Rudland Castle is impressive. Six ginormous towers. And as you can see, it's pair and pair on two corners, and then the kind of cores a single one. And between the pairs, that's the gates. So it's really not somewhere you want to try and fight into. It's not. It's sort of a case of. Surely there is better options for my day than doing this? Surely? I'd certainly be protesting there were better options for my day. So. The history of Rundland Castle. And the thing is, you will notice that this is a massive amount of text I've put up here. That's mainly because it's there as a slide and I will expand it out. But mostly I want to talk about the history. So there you go. It's nice and expanded for people who want to pause and read. And then it goes. I did count the four. The two interesting pi uh, pictures you see up in the corner are the seal of. Just get me a ch Let me get the right one of Savoy. I think it is. Ah, uh, yes, Amadeus V. Amadeus V, Count of Savoy. At one point, he leads the uh, relief English force. 
And the other picture is Thomas Pennant, who is a Welsh naturalist and historian recorder who goes on great walks around Wales and around Britain. And when he passes in 1781, he documents it being as largely ruined. Not in too dissimilar state to what we see today. Here is the thing. Why Rudlan? It's a long way from the coast if you go back to this map. You know, surely it should be more in the real area if we're talking about maritime power of castles. Surely it should be, you know, further to the coast. And the thing is, it's got a fairly deep river running to it. That's good. But it's also been the heart of the Welsh Cantref of Gwynedd. It has been the heart of the lands of northeast Wales. The heart of the area which was ruled by Griffith at Luern, who had been the last great big prince of Wales, the last real powerful ruler of Wales, who had managed to secure Wales under the rule of him. Since then it had been constantly disputed. And he died in 1063. So we're now in... 1277 that's a couple of hundred years of very interesting issues in Welsh rule uh, 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 Welsh rule when in the late 11th century the Normans did invade Gwynedd um, Rudlan gets fought over quite heavily by the princes of Gwynedd and the earls of Chester and Griffith at Llewellyn actually managed to retake the town. He'd been originally forced out by Harold Godwinson. Okay, that's a name you don't often hear mentioned in sort of military Paris, but yes, Harold Godwinson had did win several battles. He was a fairly competent military leader. People don't just randomly pick someone to try and take the throne and try and fight William, uh, the Conqueror. Godwinson was a powerful and experienced military leader who'd had success in Wales. As a result, there is a um, a Norman castle built at Twiffle in 1086. Not far from the current castle. It was built by Robert Rudlin, who had been a supporter of William the Conqueror. However... These things weren't permanently strong. Now, in twelve in August twelve seventy seven, Edward moves his forces from Flint to Rudland. Now, again, we go back to this. That's a five hours march. But he's talking about moving thousands of troops. So these days that would be nothing we worry about, but then it's, it's heavy going. Here is the key you notice with moving to Rudland. 25 ships of the sink port fleets. Now, sink ports, remember, are ports which have been given special uh, powers and status as merchant ports, but in condition, rather like feudal lords have to provide soldiers for the king as part of their homage to the king, the sink ports have to provide ships to the king on his request. He has 25 of the sink ports fleet with him, and they allow him to supply his forces. So that's the thing. He's built his first logistics base at Flint, and he's got a castle being constructed there. His next one's at Rudlin, and he starts building a castle there. And the fleet can get to him easily. They can get down the river. It's you how small the ships were, in some respects. By November 1277, the First Welsh War is over. Llewellyn at Griffith has lost. He did his gamble. He was marrying Edward's opponent's daughter. He was doing all sorts of things, and Edward had come in and basically crushed him. And gone, right... 
Incoming an army was 16,000 troops, of which 9,000 were Southern Welsh. Um, Llewellyn's own brother, Daffod, who eventually, of course, starts off the war in 1282. Run Castle begins under initially being instructed by Master Bertram, a Gascon engineer. Remember, there's a French engineer we've been talking about earlier, I think. And a Gascon engineer now. Uh, but it's handed over to James St. George because it's not moving quick that quickly. Now, they are besieged during 1282 by the Count of Savoy. Uh, not by the Count of Savoy, by the Welsh. And then relieved by the English force led by Amadeus V, who's a future Count of Savoy. Now, in 1282, he was 33 years old. He would become Count of Savoy in 1285, when he's 36. He's an experienced military commander, a trusted relative and friend of Edward I. And he brings a pretty hefty stick. But it's not exactly a difficult job for him to reinforce and relieve Rudland. Because even during the siege, they're able to get supplies for him. Thanks in many parts to that little tower there. Now, the other thing you have to remember about Rodland is it has a dry moat and a wet moat. Most of the area at the front is a dry moatish area. But you can see a sort of, if you expand this again, a six. Beyond that six towards the river was normally a wet, marshy area which often flooded. And that was the docking area where they could bring ships in for their own protection. And it was an area which they had, they could provide control of from the castle. They'd also sometimes use the other side of it, sort of where you can roughly see a nine when it was flooded enough. Now. Again in 1282, so this is a really interesting year, it's besieged, all sorts of things happen. Elizabeth, Edward I's eighth daughter, is actually born at Rudland in 1282. And 1282 is the year the castle's completed. So 1282 is a really jam-packed year in Rudland's history. In 1284, the statute of Rudland is signed at the castle, following the defeat of Llewellyn the Last who had again attacked the castle unsuccessfully. This statute ceded all the lands of the former Welsh princes to the English crown and introduced English common law. This allows Edward I's royal officials, which he's already appointing, hello Waspy, go out, legally to act as uh, sheriffs, constables and bailiffs to collect tactics, uh, taxes and enforce English law throughout Wales. Now, Northern Wales is Northern Wales is placed under control of a Justicar. Basically, his appointed local senior representative of the king, and they often exercise their power from Rudland because it's a nice central point in Northern Wales, communications-wise and logistically-wise. In 1294, the castle's attacked by Madoc at Llewellyn, and it's not taken, again. I can't think why, looking at that castle's shape. Can't think why it's not taken. After Edward I, it managed to carry on quite well. Um, 
It's one of the places King Richard II stopped in 1399 on his way to Flint, uh, where he's eventually taken prisoner by Henry IV. It was attacked by Owen Glenair in 1400. The town around it that's grown around it is badly damaged, but the castle holds out. Fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, which are peaceful, administrative and strategic situations and functions are removed from the castle to other areas because it's easier to over and cheaper to operate them from other areas, which means you get less investment in the castle and turrets. However, it's again garrisoned by royalist troops during the history of the war. Notice the theme going on here. And only was taken by parliamentary forces under Tom and Smitten after a siege in 1646. And it's the parliamentary forces in 1648 that actually demolished the castle in part to prevent for any further military use. So a lot of destruction you see around this point is by parliamentary forces after the English Civil War. Now, this is a picture of the modern inner ward, and you can see its strength. You can also see its height. You can see that the archers can be firing from you from level with you and from above you. So sticking your shield up to cover your head is not going to protect you. Unless you can do a full testudo i.e. Roman Legionnaire scenario, there are going to be archers who can fire at weak points in your armour. And look at that gate. That's just... It's mahusif. It is absolutely colossal. What's interesting is this is sort of... I would say it's looking north. Ish. And this picture is from the north. And you again get, against the sense and scale of these castles, of what it's designed as. It's designed with those huge towers to give them fields of fire. It's designed to be easily resupplied by the sea. It's designed to take control of an important logistical, important cultural, important strategic hub point. And it's all made possible by sea power, the original movement, all these things. And here is a drawing from the mid-19th century. And again, you can see the water's edge tower that anchored the wall, or the curtain wall, at the water's edge. This is a really powerful place. It's a really important place. It's not somewhere which is going to quickly and easily fall. And that's its point. That's the point of these castles. They are Edward I stamping authority. But he can't afford to be strong everywhere. He can't afford the money. No one can afford the money of a permanent occupation force that's going to be necessary to keep Wales under control forever. So he needs to be able to buy himself time. One of the other reasons you bring in settlers and you secure areas and you build settlements, which is what he's doing, is because they don't intermarry with the local population. And over time, you hope they fuse. That's actually how southern Wales have been taken over in many respects, by intermarriage. And it's much the same with northern Wales. It's what Edward I is planning, because Edward I is obsessed with stability. I would say it's his big obsession. He wants stability and security after what his father had been through. And I would say, in many ways, the Llewellyn could have got away with a lot of things. But marrying the Montfort's daughter no matter how much money and other, stuff, and other connections she brings you. It 
that's going to set off a huge amount of red flags in Edward's head. Immediately. Because Monfort had almost taken the throne. He'd almost managed to take, uh, kick his father out and take the throne away from his father. Edward isn't going to forget that. So we've got it coming up again. There will be a release telling you what's coming up. But Robert Calder, look him up. It's going to be cool. And Old Richard, if you're watching this, you'll know that I've taken your idea and instead of putting it to the patron vote, I've nicked it entirely for the uh, 24th of July to the 8th of August period. Enjoy. <laughs>